There are things in music theory that make me ask the question, why? And more often than not, the answer is, well, just because, that's how it is. Which does not work for me because if you're going to ask me to follow a rule, there needs to be a very clear and logical reason as to why. So in this video, we are gonna be looking at some music theory rules that I think are ridiculous and should be rewritten. And that's where I come in because I think these rules should stay exactly as they are. So we're gonna have a bit of a discussion here to see whether or not these rules should be changed, which they shouldn't, and we should see how they work in the context of music. Okay, so the invisible bar line rule. Yes. I don't think we need to keep this one. So the invisible bar line rule, let's discuss what the invisible bar line rule actually is. In a measure of music, you have four beats typically. If you have four, four time, this means that you have four quarter notes per measure. Now you can only group these beats in certain ways. Why? Because if you don't, writing music looks crazy no. odd and looks so. really, really inconsistent. So for example, if I was to play a rhythm, right? And if this rhythm was to be, let's say, hmm, ta, ta, ti, tu. So this is quarter note, quarter note, half note. Can you clap with me? One, two, here we go. Quarter, quarter, half note. Great, now let's move the half note to beat two. So we're going quarter, half note, quarter. Yes. Great. If we were to write this music, it would have to be quarter note, quarter note with a tie, to another quarter note, followed by another quarter note. We cannot group beats two and three together because in music, sheet music especially, it is so hard to read that we have to make sure we no. respect the invisible bar line. So rule. you're you're telling me that it's less confusing to see music with a whole bunch of ties and extra notes on it than it would be to simply write a quarter note and a half note and a quarter note. Absolutely. No. Because if we have a lot of music, Showing the tie actually indicates that you're holding longer through beats two and three as opposed to the half note. And when you get to some more challenging time signatures, that is super important. So we have to respect the invisible bar line rule. Uh, mm. <laughs> you know, I don't like it. I think it's ridiculous. What would happen in the world if we didn't? Like, would it, cause it, it doesn't mess me up. Does here's, it mess the drummers here, up? Is here, this an issue for drummers? Here's the thing. When you are communicating music to others, you have to make sure that it's legible for everyone. And if you have a half note in the middle of a measure of music, that is really confusing because it's just a random half note. You have the tie to the other two notes there and it kind of makes that it That looks perfectly reasonable. See, I'm unfortunately <laughs> gonna have to put an F on that <gasps> assignment because that is the incorrect way to write your music notation. You have to have a tie in between beats two and three to respect the invisible bar line rule. All right, so our next subject of conversation is ties versus slurs. Now, I know they look the same. When you have a tie and a slur, it pretty much visually looks exactly identical, but they are used in different ways. So. If you're tying notes together, this means that you are holding notes through a bar line. If you're slurring notes, that means you're making a group of notes smooth. So for example, I'm gonna play something on the piano and I want you to hear the difference between the tie and the slur. And I'm gonna point out which ones are happening where. All right. So you're gonna hear slurs and ties and I want you to listen for the difference. I'll point out where the slur is and the tie is after. Here we go. All right. One, two, here we go. Okay, so there was four, four time. You could hear four beats per measure, but there were some moments where it tied across and some moments that were smooth. I'm gonna play it again, and I want you to shout out when you think there's a slur and when you think there's a tie. Are you ready? All right, here we go. One, two, here we go. I don't hear you yelling. Oh, um, slur. <laughs> Die, slur. Okay, there we go. So I'm gonna do it again and you can follow with me. Here we go. One, two, here we go. Slur. Slur. Tie. tie. Da, 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 da. There's a slur. slur. Tie. Two, oh, okay, three, okay, 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 okay. So fine. Whatever. But, and, mm -hmm. why could, of all of the things, mm -hmm. why couldn't they just make it a different way of showing slurs and ties. 
Like, couldn't a tie be like a squiggly line and a slur could be a smooth line? That's fair. That's a very good question. Thanks for bringing this up. So historically, slurs and ties were written the same way because, well, the person who invented it, I don't know who, decided that... <laughs> The person historically who wrote these actually made it so that the slurs and the ties were similar because it carried through the bar and, well, it just looks like a rope. But the slur is kind of tying everything together as well, which is why it also is looks this per is like this a rope. Is this person still with us? This person is probably no longer with us. I, I feel have, like... I'm we could probably move with the technology. I'm of, sure we of could. New I'm sure we shapes. could. But we have to respect the culture and tradition of music. And please don't eat in my classroom. Thank you. Moving on. Staccato versus staccato with a tenuto. Okay. So this is a fun one, and I'm gonna. I don't even understand the sentence I just said. I'm gonna have to look into my teacher stuff here. Oh, teacher stuff. For this lovely diagram that I've mm. written. So. Okay. Here we see a quarter note with a lovely little dot underneath. This is a staccato. This is what you see in most music, and this just means detached. That's it, play it nice and detached. Okay. You can play this, at, think about it mathematically as half of the beat that is actually there. So if you were to play a quarter note with a staccato, it would actually be the same value as an eighth note, which is kind of a little bit more technical, but oh. just play it detached. It's a little that's, bit easier right, to think about cool. that way. So, this second one here, staccatissimo. Can you try to say that? Staccatissimo? You guys can try it at home. Staccatissimo. This means play aggressively detached. So, a little bit more in, in it than the staccato. It's a little bit more fun. You with me so far? I just think that we could just do with a single dot under the note and that would suffice for that's, playing detached. That's fair enough. I understand. I feel like we're splitting hairs here. I, I love splitting hairs, which is why I love theory rules so much. Last one here, mezzo staccato. Okay. This one is a little bit stickier, if you will. Mezzo staccato means you are playing it detached, but just slightly sticky, so you're letting your hand go a little bit slower than if you were to play just a normal staccato. Such a contradiction. Staccatissimo, yes. And I would also argue that this, like, if you're playing a piece that requires this much nuance, mm -hmm. how how about just feeling it and having, like, the emotion behind the performance as opposed to being need, needing to be told all of this? Like, and don't I, you think if you're in it, you're gonna... I think you're onto something there, and I think the point of music is to definitely express emotion, mm. these are your tools to do that. So if you want to just play with emotions that you feel without the like the specifics, then that's totally fine, right. but it's also good to know the rules just so you can have a little bit more tools to work with. Okay, fine. Cool. We'll see. All right, this one's a doozy. Double flats and double sharps. The most ridiculous thing ever. Putting a double flat beside a note is basically like saying, just play a different note altogether. So if I see a B double flat, mm -hmm. what I'm supposed to play, I have to see B and then it's flat and then it's and double it's... flat. It's the same as A. Mm -hmm. Why would you just write an A? So this is really interesting and I totally agree. I think these double sharps and double flats are a little bit annoying, ah! but I think they're also important to talk about. One, because when you have a very advanced key signature, these double sharps and double flats happen all the time. So it's I good know. to know in case you want to go to that kind of level of playing. And the second thing is that when you're reading sheet music, you don't want to miss an accidental here or an accidental there, especially when you're trying to write music for someone else. Mm. You want to make sure you get the right note and being in the key, if you just write a normal note, it's going to be played differently. And let me show you what I mean. Okay. So I'm going to lift up my teacher stuff here to the correct <laughs> page. I'm not laughing. I'm prepared, I promise. <laughs> there it is. Nope. No. Where is it? I found it. Some, there it is. <laughs> All right, class. So we're going to be looking at double sharps and double flats. So let's say we have this note here. We have F. Okay? F is the first space of the treble clef. Great. But what happens if we do this? If I go like this, I put an X and then an O. It looks like I'm playing, playing tic-tac-toe. That's what we're doing. It's really not. Let me put some staves on that to make it a little bit easier to see. So now we have an X and we have the F, which means we have a double sharp. We have to go up two semitones, Doing like F you said. to F double sharp, which is just the same as G, so why wouldn't we just write a G? 
because if our key signature, which I haven't written here, is, let's say, for example, in F sharp major. Are you going to write F sharp major on there? Well, I'm not going to because I don't have enough space, oh, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. But if I had F sharp major and I just wrote an F, it would already be sharp? It would already be sharp. So I could not get that natural sound. Same with G as well. Because F sharp major has a G sharp in it, we have to make sure that we make Why it wouldn't a double you just sharp. write A? Because we're not using A, we're using F. Okay, well, why wouldn't you just write G? <laughs> because if we're using G, right, if we just put a G here yeah. without anything else, if our key signature had a G sharp in it, which it does in F sharp major, that means that this is going to be played a sharp. Well, then why this don't you just put a natural be beside it? And that is where we can't do that because what? we're lowering it by a semitone. We're making it outside of the scale. We have to stay in the scale, which means that the natural is kind of like a reset button, yeah. whereas double sharp and double flat keep us inside the key. So it's a technicality. It's a very much a technicality. It's literally a technicality. And I don't really like it very much. I will, I'm not gonna lie, it's one of those rules that I'm kind of on the fence about, but mm. I think it's still good to understand how it works so that if you do come across it in any of your music, mm. you'll understand how to approach it. I understand place. where you're coming from, from an educator perspective. Well, there we I go. I suppose, also it's ridiculous. And I understand where you're coming from, from a playing perspective, because it is <laughs> so frustrating to go and work through all of these double sharps and flats. Thank you. All right, the tritone, one of my most favorite intervals uh -huh. because it's so crunchy okay. and one of Lisa's favorites. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. <laughs> I got through my entire piano playing lesson exam taking career without knowing what a tritone was mm -hmm. and I was fine and I I think that they sound terrible and we shouldn't have to know about them. Fair enough. I disagree. I think tritones are an amazing tool for you to know how to use especially when you are improvising or you're coming up with your own songs, tritones can kind of be the reset button to bring but everything back to the start. Why would you play something that sounds terrible? Now let me break this down. So, here is your perfect fourth interval. You have one, two, three, four. Yep. And then you have perfect fifth interval. Yep. One, two, three, four, five. Now, with all the other, other intervals, ooh, I'm going too fast here. You have a major second and a minor second. You have a major third and a minor third. With these perfect intervals, you don't have a minor option. It's perfect and that's it, except for this note here. And this note is kind of the note we use for our tritone. You can call it the sharp four or the flat could we, five. Could we call it something else though? Like. <laughs> Could what that would you not like just be call? a major something or a minor something? Well, it couldn't be because it's actually both at the same time. So if you were to say major fourth, it's actually a major, a minor fifth, and vice versa. So that's where it can get a little bit confusing. Yeah, you using know what? I the completely tritone, understand, actually. Using the tritone is the best way to go about using that interval. And when you play a dominant chord or a diminished chord, you have those really crunchy intervals used to reset yourself to go to a different spot in your music, and it's a great tool to use. Okay, so clearly some of our conversation here was in jest, but I can't tell you how many times Sam and I have had these slightly heated debates <laughs> about music theory rules. Um, and it's good. It's good to have conversations. It's good to challenge rules. And it's good to try to find new ways to understand why the rules exist. So I would love to hear from you about what you think of these. What music theory rules make you want to pull out your hair? Um, which of these did you agree with? All of them. <laughs> And which of these were you like, yeah, these are silly rules. Um, so comment below and let us know. And um, yeah. thanks Cla for I hanging guess, out. I guess class dismissed, I guess. <laughs> I really hope you enjoyed that video. Now, if you followed our channel for a bit, you'll know that I love this instrument. And I've been playing piano since I was just a little kid. And even though my relationship with it hasn't always been smooth sailing, I'm so grateful I had the opportunity to learn. But I'm one of the lucky ones, and I had parents who supported and encouraged my interest in music, and they had the means to buy me a piano and lessons. And not all kids are so lucky. And here in Canada, where piano is based, school music programs are chronically underfunded, if they exist at all. Many schools don't even have a program, or if they do, there aren't enough instruments, or they're too old and broken. And all of this means an entire generation of kids is growing up without the chance to explore and discover the life-changing power of music. And I really mean that. Learning an instrument isn't just a great hobby. It helps kids to develop their confidence and self-esteem. And it gives them a sense of belonging. It also helps to reduce anxiety. All of these things are super important to me. 
And it's why I'm so excited to announce that Piano is partnering with Canada's music education charity, Music Accounts. Through their Band Aid program, Music Accounts invests in music education by providing grants and funding for schools and community groups to create music programs for kids who need it. And I need your help. Until October 10th, when you donate to Music Counts, through the links below, 100% of the money goes to charity. We don't keep a cent. And it gets better, because Piano will match every donation up to $50,000. Click the link in the description below to learn more and see what options are available. Every donation will get you free lessons from Piano, plus some incredible bonuses. And on behalf of everyone at Piano, Music Counts, and all of the kids who are going to benefit from your generous support, thank you.